great. That's awesome. Welcome. How did you find out about us? Just yell it out. It's okay. Support groups. Love it. How many of you are in our support groups? A support group. Or how about any support group? All right. That, that's not a lot of people. You guys need to, need to go to support groups. You need support. Well, you know what? I would love there to be more areas. And if you would like to start a support group in your area, call Catherine or call me. I'm Toby Burko. I'm the executive director. And we can talk about that because I, uh, I love starting support groups. Um, we started a new support group this year that's really taken off. And there's one more in the pipeline um, that I know about. So uh, where do you live? Santa Clarita. Anyone else from Santa Clarita or near Santa Clarita? Look, you have a friend back there, right there. You guys need to meet each other at break. Okay, raise your hand. Or stay, she's going to stand up. You, you now have a lupus friend in your neighborhood. There you go. Beautiful. I love that. All right. I am Toby Burko. I said that already. Um, I see lots of familiar faces, which is always good to see. So thank you. And you're going to be seeing and hearing a lot of me today because I am going to uh, run the show. So that's always good. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for making time today to come to the UCLA Medical Center for this conference. This conference is for you, the lupus patients, and their loved ones, their, their support system. Yeah, have a seat. Absolutely. Sit wherever you want. Um, and we have such a good program today. We have doctors, researcher, advocates, social workers. We have tons of really great uh, information. And we try to do something a little different each time. How many of you were at the uh, Irvine, Irvine one? Well, Elizabeth Prescott's back. She's going to be doing a small little thing after lunch on breathing, so that's super great. So it's a good refresher course for you. But other than that, it's all new material, which is good. Come on in. There are plenty of seats up here. There are some seats on this side. Don't be shy. Get cozy. As many of you know, Lupus LA strives to find the cause of and a cure for lupus while serving the needs of you, the lupus community of Southern California. And we keep trying to expand that all the time. And we have three real main areas of focus. The first one is medical research. You're going to hear us about that uh, today from Dr. Wallace and Dr. Jeffries. That means that we fund medical research, and we fund it through uh, our partners, both local and national, to try to, again, find ca the causes and a cure for lupus and new treatments. The second focus that we have is for patient services. And you're all here today, so I know that you're familiar with it. But you might not be familiar with the breadth of things that we do for patient services. Catherine McMahon, who's our program manager, who's floating around somewhere, she'll be up here a little bit later, really oversees an amazing program. And it's such a resource for lupus patients and their caregivers. We provide one-on-one -on -one consultations. We help you with healthcare navigation, doctor referrals. Uh, we have emergency grants available, which offer $500 once a year for lupus-related things. And that could be anything from sun protective clothing to helping with energy bills to medical co-pays. We have a whole list of things that qualify. So if you haven't um, checked that out, you should. And it's on a need basis. And, um, and if you know someone who needs help, we're here for that. Also, we run support groups, which we just spoke about. We have nine adult support groups right now. Hopefully, this year, we're going to be expanding to 10 or maybe 11 if the woman in the front row uh, starts one in Santa Clarita. Um, and they're really this amazing resource for you. We're going to spend a little bit of time this afternoon talking about support groups, why they're important, how going to a support group is really advocating both for yourself and for your community. So that's very important. And lastly, our third focus is promoting awareness and advocacy for healthcare initiatives surrounding lupus. You know, as you all know, lupus is not a necessarily visual disease. Most people, how many of you have heard, you don't look sick, right? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of hands would go up really quickly. 
How can you be in pain? You look fine. You're walking around, right? So making sure that we advocate for ourselves and as an organization we advocate for you, lupus patients, is really important. Making sure that laws are in place that make sure that people get treatment and have access to treatment is very important to us. Um, as well as making sure that people even know what lupus is. A million and a half people have lupus in this country uh, that we know about, I'm going to say. I bet you it's more. And it's growing. And we really need to share information about lupus so that people understand what it is. We couldn't meet all of the goals of, of the programs that we have or this patient conference without our uh, corporate sponsors for today. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Mountain Pharmaceuticals and Pharma for helping underwrite today's program. And before, oh, yay. I don't know if anyone is here. I don't know. Is anyone here from either? Actually, Jody, are you here? Oh, you're here. Hi. Pharma representative, so thank you. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out to Tori Brown, who is visiting us from Portland. Where are you, Tori? You're up back there. Tori uh, is the executive director of Molly's Fund, which is a lupus organization up in Portland, Oregon. They do amazing work. So if you know people, uh, you know, north of San Francisco, uh, they're, they're great people to call. And they also have a really good website and a lot of resources. We have a lot of resources and a really good website, too. But, you know, share the wealth. And they do, thing, they do fun things like Facebook chats and stuff. So, yes, Molly's Fund. And Molly is a lupus patient um, who started this organization with her family. And it's really grown and taken off. And they're lovely people and do amazing work. So thank you for being here today. A few housekeeping rules for those of you who haven't been to one of our patient conferences. Inside your uh, folders are some index cards. For all of the Q&As that we do, we ask that you write down your question, and then we'll have a couple of people in the aisles to come and get them, uh, and then bring them up to the podium. Either the presenter will moderate or I'll moderate questions. I can guarantee you we will not get through all your questions. However, what we do try to do is get answers and then send them out via email. Um, and if there's a specific question that you have that you really need answered, um, please see Catherine. Catherine, raise your hand. Come on up front for a second. This is Catherine McMahon. I know many of you have spoken to Catherine on the phone. <laughs> Catherine does an amazing job at handling anything patient. So um, when you call the office, this is who you speak with. And again, if you have a really pressing question or need some immediate assistance, she is the lady to talk to, so she'll be floating around today. Um, after our first presenter, we're going to have a 15-minute break. There are um, things to do out in the lobby. There are restrooms. The, the, the snacks should still be out. I just want to say I know Dr. Wallace didn't talk about clinical trials, but there are representatives today from uh, Dr. Wallace's office. Dr. Wallace runs a lot of clinical trials. Clinical trials are super important to helping us find out more information about lupus. Um, they're also, clinical trials are also there to help you get care if you can't afford it. Sometimes there are options uh, for that as well. So um, if you haven't checked out clinical trials or considered clinical trials, I'm going to say you should, or you should at least find out about it. I know, again, Dr. Wallace is going to talk about it. Um, so they're going to be out there certainly during break and maybe a little longer into lunch. Not totally sure about that. All right, let's get started. Look, Dr. Wallace, I'm five minutes early. Um, as many of you know, and I know a lot of you here today actually to specifically hear Dr. Dan Wallace speak. He is an esteemed rheumatologist, teacher, researcher. Everyone's really long bios are in your folder, so I'm not going to read them to you. Um, he's the founder of Lupus LA, or one of the founders of Lupus LA, and is really passionate about helping lupus patients and trying to find a cure. We're so lucky to have him here today. Um, so, Dr. Wallace, you're on up. Great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 
Thank you. So we have till 1030. And what I'm going to do is give just an overview of lupus so that everybody here is on the same page. Um, we have a var wide variety. We have some How many people here have lupus? How many people are a significant other of a lupus patient? How many are here because you think you might have lupus? Everybody knows, that's good. Um, so I'm gonna give an overview of what lupus is, and then I'm gonna segue into where things are going from here, and then we're gonna have a three or four minute stretch when everybody fills out three by five cards and I'm going to answer, and I'm going to try to answer all the questions, Toby, because uh, I can, I can, we can be quick and efficient. So uh, let's see. Now I just got to figure out where the where the slides are. I don't, I don't see any clickers or buttons. Okay, now we've got to... Okay. Um, does somebody want to... Is it projection? Where are we at? Hi, is there a clicker? How do I advance? Okay. What? Ah, all right. Very good. Is it this one? We'll go like this. We'll close this. And start here. And then you can just click Just like that. Yeah. All right. Very good. So, lupus is what happens when the body becomes allergic to itself. It's the opposite of cancer. It's the opposite of AIDS. It's a progressive, chronic autoimmune disorder resulting in, in characterized by inflammation and resulting in tissue damage. It waxes and wanes. It flares, it remitted, it remits, it relapses, and it can affect any part of the body. Of the people with lupus in the United States, 85% are women. Because about 20% of lupus is genetic, and about 80% of lupus is environmental, Epidemiologic studies have shown that one in 250 African American women in the U.S., one in 1,000 white women, one in 10,000 white men have the disease. In African American women, it has a very, very high prevalence, but in people of color, such as Hispanics and Asians, it is greater but highly variable. For example, there's more Chinese people than Japanese people with lupus. The highest prevalences of lupus are actually among Native Americans. Do we have any Native Americans here? A few? One. One in 70 Sioux Indians has lupus, so it can get very, very high. And basically, we divide lupus into two types organ-threatening and non-organ-threatening, and it's half in half. But when we look at the spectrum of lupus, um, the majority of lupus is systemic, half organ-threatening, meaning heart, lung, kidney, liver, brain, or bone marrow, and half non-organ-threatening. There's about 70,000 cases a year of drug-induced lupus in the United States, and 14 drugs cause 90% of the conditions. And I'm sort of putting stuff out because if you want to ask me specific questions about any points I bring out, put it on your three by five card and I'll get to it. And if we don't get to it, we'll email you the answer. 
about 10% of lupus is just skin. And about 10% of lupus patients meet criteria for other rheumatic syndromes, such as scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, myositis. Most lupus patients develop the disease during their reproductive years, and where the ratio of women to men is 9 to 1, and in children and in people over 60, it goes down to about 2 to 1. There have been many different criteria for lupus, but suffice it to say that this is only for the purpose of research studies, epidemiologic studies, and demographic studies, and it's a value for um, people who are insurers or people who are looking at public health issues. You can have lupus without meeting criteria. The most commonly used criteria is the 1997 where there are 11 criteria, four of which are skin, four of which are organ, three of which are lab, and you need four of them to meet the criteria. So we're going to go through some of these. The common symptoms and signs of lupus are aching, low-grade fevers, rashes, pain on taking a deep breath, more loss of hair than would be normal, fingers turning different colors in cold weather or, or rain outs, sensitivity to sunlight, swelling, sores in the mouth, swollen glands, and mostly fatigue. I want anybody in this room with lupus who is not tired to raise their hand. <laughs> One, okay. So I think I've made my point. The skin features of lupus are highly variable. Basically, ultraviolet light from the sun hits the skin, activates lupus cells under the skin. The reason why we have the butterfly rash is because that lupus means wolf in Latin, and that's the angle at which ultraviolet light hits the skin. But you can have skin lupus anywhere in the body, usually sun exposed. One can have mouth sores, hair loss, lesions in the dermis, which is SCLA, as opposed to the epidermis, which is discoid lupus, vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels, blisters, or fatty nodules. People can have involvement of the joints. How many people here in loop with lupus never have any joint or muscle pain. Okay, so it's everybody. It can affect the muscles. It can affect the joints. It can affect the supporting structures of muscles and joints, the tendons, the ligaments, the bursae. It can cause damage to the tissues. It can thin the bones. Lupus can affect all parts of the heart. There's three parts of the heart, the pericardium, which is the sac around it, the myocardium, which is, includes the coronary arteries, which is the middle of the heart, and the endocardium, which is the inner lining of the heart. One can have pericarditis, myocarditis, coronary arteritis, or endocarditis. And lupus patients have seven to tenfold increased risks of coronary heart disease and stroke. Lupus can affect the lung, just like the heart. When God created your lungs and heart, it came gift wrap. So there's a layer around the heart called the pericardium, around the lung called the pleura, around the belly called the peritoneum, and around your joints called the synovium. And inflammation of the gift wrapping is a very common feature of this. So you can get inflammation of the pleura, which is scarier than it is serious. You can get inflammation of the interstitium or of the lung. You can get bleeding in the lung, scarring in the lung. One can get clots to the lung. Pressures in the lung can be increased. And because of the immune system, one can get infections in the lung. Lupus can affect the brain. Lupus can make one depressed can cause what we call lupus fog 
or brain farts or cognitive dysfunction where you can't balance your checkbook, you can't remember names and dates, you can't think clearly, but it's not Alzheimer's because it comes and goes, except under specific circumstances. How many people here with lupus do not have a lupus fog and think clearly all the time? One. Okay, so not the same person. Um, when lupus inflames the brain, you can get seizures. You can get focal areas of the brain involved. And then the peripheral nervous system, which allows you to move your arms and legs and feel things, it can cause numbness, burning, tingling. How many people here sometimes get some of those symptoms? Most of you. So you can get neurolupus from inflammation. You can get neurolupus from a blood clot. You can get lupus neurolupus from not enough blood flow. You get too much blood flow, you get a headache. You don't get enough blood flow, you get a fog. You can have scarring in the brain from previous lupus um, activity, which is organic brain syndrome. You can have sticky blood in the brain, which causes sludging and altered flow. And this needs to be differentiated from meningitis, from drugs causing it, or fibromyalgia. Lupus can affect the kidney usually causes swelling, protein in the urine, and active sediments associated with high blood pressure. How many people here have lupus in their kidney? So it's about 20%. And there's many different flavors of lupus in the kidney, from just a little off to putting one in kidney failure. And it runs the whole gamut. And this is a very difficult aspect of lupus to treat. So when we look at the prevalence of different organ involvement, you can get lupus in the kidney, lupus causing low blood counts, lupus causing inflammation of the brain, lupus affecting the lung, lupus uh, ca affecting the liver, causing visual changes, causing chest pain, abdominal pain. And when you add it all up, it's about half. So half is what I call good lupus, in half is more challenging lupus. Blood counts can be off. When you do a CBC, you look at red counts, white counts, and platelets. You can have low red counts or anemia in lupus. It could be from many different causes, from low iron, low folic acid, low B12, sickle cell anemia, to uh, destruction of red cells. You can have low platelets, which can cause bleeding or bruising. You can have low white counts, which predispose one towards infection. And, um, and there's many non-lupus causes. For example, in lupus, certain drugs can cause abnormalities. <clears throat> you can have infections that alter your blood counts. Medications can lower blood counts. And no single blood test determines whether a person has lupus. It's sort of a, we call it a gamish. It's a combination of different determinations. We look at ANA, and how many people here with lupus have a negative ANA? None. So ANAs are seen in everybody, just about everybody with lupus. There's a host of other autoantibodies. There's about actually 118 of them, but we only care about 10 of them or so. And we'll show you their importance in a minute. Sometimes we diagnose lupus by looking at tissue under the microscope, whether it's a skin biopsy or a kidney biopsy. But we monitor lupus with getting a blood count, a urine, a blood chemistry, and we look for inflammation with like a SED rate or a CRP or lowering a complement. And sometimes we have to monitor the disease with imaging studies. There are many, it's just not an ANA, there's many different kinds of ANA. ANA is when you take a nucleus of a cell and you make an antibody to it and you stain it and you look for to see whether it, you picture a cell like an egg with a yolk and is the, is the whole yolk um, light up that's called diffuse? Is it the area around the yolk that's called peripheral? Is it just a few areas that we call speckled? Or is it the nucleolus, which is usually seen in scleroderma and called nucleolar? ANAs are not specific for lupus because over um, 
2% of healthy people have a positive ANA. And as we grow younger, it gets more. 13% of the United States over the age of 60 has a positive ANA. Just as ANAs are positive in almost all other rheumatic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and so forth. ANAs are positive in infections, mono, e. Epstein-Barr, hepatitis. Many drugs, uh, such as doxycycline, minocycline, hydralazine, for example, a blood pressure medicine, can cause ANAs. And ANA doesn't confirm a diagnosis of lupus. So this is what I was saying in, in that maybe up to 32 million people in the United States have ANAs, but only one million people at most have lupus. So it's just a screening test. The accuracy of ANAs depends on the disease. So we can see ANAs here, 93% with lupus, 85% with scleroderma, 60% with myositis, 48% with Sjogren's, 64 with Raynaud's, 41% with rheumatoid arthritis. And there's many different antibodies that are important in lupus. The antibodies in lupus, some are to the nucleus, some are to the cell membrane, some are to the cytoplasm, some are to the red cells, some are to the white cells, the platelets, the nerve cells, or immune complexes. And I should mention that this conference is being taped, and you will be able, if you want to, Go through some of this in more detail. You can uh, watch this talk on your home computer, and you can get a, um, you know, a recording of it. So, so lupus antibodies are some are bit more important than others. The most important ones are anti-DNA, which is positive in a little more than half. Anti-SM stands for somebody named Smith, who was named after positive in a quarter with lupus, and only 1 in 20,000 people with SM don't have lupus, so it's a very specific antibody. With DNA, the levels go up and down as the disease gets more active, and it's really nice to follow. With SM, it's either there or it doesn't. You only need to do it once. About a third of lupus patients have something called an antiphospholipid antibody, and a third of them have a thromboembolic event from it. So, and that's defined as a blood clot, a thrombosis, a pulmonary embolus, a stroke, or even a miscarriage. How many people in this room have had a thromboembolic event from phospholipids? So it's about 10 of you there. Okay. Those who have sticky blood can um, have lots of complications. They can cause miscarriages, as I said, strokes, certain types of rashes, blood clots to the lung, pulmonary hypertension, and drugs can cause this antibody as well, such as even drugs like Humira or Enbro given for rheumatoid arthritis can cause this antibody to form as a side effect. When we want to test for lupus in the brain, all the blood tests are worthless. So, you know, if, you, if you're having brain fog, and we really need to do something about it. We need, the only way to find out if it's really altering your quality of life is to do very specialized imaging, do a spinal tap, get some nerve cell antibodies, or electrical studies of the brain, such as, let's say, an EEG. So neurolupus, you cannot diagnose or treat on the basis of blood tests. So putting it all together... 97% have an ANA, about 80% are achy, about 70% have some type of skin uh, manifestations, about half have low complements, fevers, high DNA, or a low white count, about 40% have pain on taking a deep breath or protein in the urine or anemia, about a third get blood clots or have significant central nervous system findings, and about uh, one in eight has really obvious swollen glands and fluid in the lungs. But there are many conditions that can cause these things too. It's not always lupus. In fact, a Lupus Foundation of America study published about 10 years ago asked people if they had ever been told by a doctor, this is a marketing agency in New York, 
they contacted in those days several thousand people by telephone and said, how many people, how many, has a doctor ever told you that you have lupus? And then they took the number that said yes, and then they followed it up by looking at the charts, and only one in three really had it. So not everybody who's told by any doctor, you know, and it could be, you know, your family doctor, that they have lupus really has it. So all the other autoimmune diseases can cause can be confused with lupus. Infections can be caused and confused with lupus. Fibromyalgia is confused with lupus. How many people here have fibromyalgia? So it's seen in about 30% with lupus. Allergies can be confused with lupus. Early MS or myasthenia can be confused with lupus. And early lymphoma can be confused with lupus. People who, um, many um, young people, who have low titer ANAs could be bipolar, malnourished, addicted to certain substances, and mimic lupus because they're um, vitamin deficient and so forth. And I've even had patients with an early unknown pregnancy diagnosed with lupus. So some of the major th factors that coexist with lupus is Sjogren's syndrome named after Heinrich Sjogren in Sweden in 1933, who found a group of people who had trouble getting tears in their eyes and saliva in their mouth and were tired and achy. And a lot of them, they all had ANAs and some of them had Sjogren's antibodies. And Sjogren's syndrome is seen in 20% with lupus. How many here have Sjogren's syndrome? About 20% of you. And two-thirds have certain antibodies that are specific for lupus. And the major uh, vigilance or take-home point with Sjogren's is 12% develop a lymphoma over 20 years, and they need special monitoring. There's a group of people who have what we call UCTD. UCTD stands for Undifferentiated Connective Tissue Disease. These are people who are tired, achy, inflamed, they have positive ANAs, they have high SED rates, you give them steroids, for example, they get better, but when you look at the criteria, they don't meet criteria. So they're called UCTD, and they respond to the same medicines. And if you follow these people for 20 years, a third have everything go away spontaneously, a third stay a UCTD, and a third become lupus or rheumatoid. So this group requires very careful attention. And fibromyalgia. How many, we said, said about 25% of you have fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia means I touch you, you hurt. It's where it's more in the muscles than in the joints. It, lupus tends to be more in the hands and the feet, and fibro tends to be more uh, centripetal as opposed to centrifugal. It's more upper back and neck area. It's more buttock area. And it's associated with morning stiffness and tenderness. You wake up in the morning not feeling refreshed, but your inflammatory tests are normal and your labs are normal. But certain medications given for lupus, like steroids, can cause fibromyalgia, can make the skin more sensitive to being touched, plus difficulty coping with the diagnosis also does that. Historically, um, the most common causes of dying from lupus is active disease, active inflammation, renal failure, or infection. And now we're seeing more people um, who are succumbing to accelerated hardening of the arteries from medicines given for lupus and lupus itself. Those people are developing hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, and as a result, they're having heart attacks in their 30s and 40s. So the prognosis of lupus is that if you have drug-induced lupus, skin and lupus, skin-only lupus, and non-organ-threatening lupus, where you're just tired or achy, but the heart, lung, kidney, liver, brain, and bone marrow are normal, those individuals tend to have a normal life expectancy. Prior to 1949, 
which was a pivotal year for three reasons. Number one, steroids became available, chemotherapies became available, and the LA cell prep became available. So this was a very important year. So Marion Ropes, who headed the lupus clinic at Massachusetts General, which is Harvard, wrote a book on lupus in 1949 where she followed 150 patients and basically half died within two years and half got better. And that was the original prognosis. So as you see, the prognosis in lupus has steadily improved so that now about 93% live five years, 85% live 10 years. For those with kidney disease prior to the availability of dialysis in 1969, nobody made it. Now, most people with lupus in their kidney survive at least 20 years. So socioeconomic factors are very, very important. My mentor, Ed Dubois, had a private practice in Beverly Hills and ran the lupus clinic at LA County USC Medical Center. His best friend and contemporary was Naomi Rothfield, who ran the lupus clinic at Bellevue in New York and had a private practice in Westchester County. And as you can see, if you, um, if you are educated about lupus, if you can afford your medications, if you can afford transportation to the clinic, if you can read and write English, and if you're compliant with your medicines, you do better than patients um, uh, who can't. And, this, and these patients were treated by the same doctors. So how do we treat lupus? So some of you have heard me say this. When I was a uh, second year medical student, um, the dermatologist came up for our first lecture and said, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about dermatology in five sentences. If the lesion is wet, you dry it with a cream. If the lesion is moist, you, um, I mean, if the lesion is dry, you moisturize it with an ointment. If the lesion is um, wet, you dry it with a cream. If it looks inflamed, you give a steroid. If it looks infected, you give an antibiotic. If you don't know what it is, you biopsy it, and that's dermatology. So <laughs> there's only... Four things I can do for my patients. Number one, I can prescribe physical measures. I can send them you know, exercise um, and uh, physical uh, activities. I can prescribe medication. If the patient has deformities, um, I could like, send them to an orthopedist for orthopedic surgery. And the hardest of all is sitting down and talking to the patient. So these are the four things that we treat lupus with. From a physical measure standpoint, we tell people to avoid the sun, and I can go into a lot more detail with your questions. Changes in barometric pressure make lupus worse. It doesn't matter if it's hot or cold or wet or dry, but if the barometer changes from hot to cold or wet to dry, most of you make very good meteorologists and can tell your significant others when it's gonna rain. Um, we can prescribe physical therapy, occupational therapy. And if you're a farmer, you may want to consider another occupation. If you're a tuna fisherman, you may want to consider an occupation. If, you know, um, if you're going to be on the computer all day using your hands, you may need certain modifications. So vocational rehabilitation is important. Exercise isometrics are much better than isotonics, where we strengthen and stretch as opposed to weight lift and row. Certain diets and vitamins are better for lupus than others. Echinacea is bad because it boosts the immune system too much. Alfalfa sprouts are bad. Fish oil is good. And I can answer your questions about your herbs and spices and nuts and berries as we go along. <laughs> the one way of treating fatigue, which everybody here has, is to pace yourself. If you go 20 hours a day without a rest, you're going to be no fun to be with for days. On the other hand, if you lay in bed and feel sorry for yourself, that's not going to do any good either. So you need to be busy for a couple hours, rest for 10 minutes, be busy for another couple hours, take a lunch break. And if you take four or five breaks during the day, you can do as much as anybody else. So the, everything listed on this slide has been shown in double-blind placebo-controlled trials to be effective for lupus, and none of them involve giving a lupus medicine. 
First of all, learning about the disease, filling your prescriptions, having access to a rheumatologist, um, being able to have good body mechanics and exercise, uh, learning how to treat uh, Raynaud's or lupus fog with cognitive therapy or biofeedback, making sure that your primary care doctor screens your blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, watches your weight and makes sure that you don't smoke, getting uh, bone densities regularly, cardiograms, chest x-rays in those who are high risk, Anybody with a temperature gets a prompt evaluation and you're screened for sticky blood and usually given low-dose aspirin if you have it. Talking to the patient, you tell the patient there's a 10% chance that their uh, daughter will get lupus, there's a 2% chance that their son will get lupus. If one does not have organ-threatening disease or good lupus, there's a 20% chance that it will be turned bad in the first five years, but if you take tr some of the medicines, like antimalarials, it goes down to 10%. That the head bones connect to the lupus bone. To differentiate, there is a psychoneuroimmunology that's very important here. We need to differentiate fibromyalgia from lupus, because one's treated with serious drugs and one isn't. And stress and trauma can make lupus worse. To treat lupus, we manage it with uh, sunscreens, avoiding the sun, and it's topical steroids and these other medicines which go all the way from Advil to chemo are used in treating lupus. Advil and Aleve do help fevers, headaches, aching, pleurisy from lupus but knew nothing about the underlying disease and have to be used carefully. Animalarial such as Plaquenil, protect one, if you look at the top line, Protect one from ultraviolet light, lower cholesterol levels, thin the blood, and block certain chemicals that promote inflammation. That usually when we get, how many people here are on Plaquenil or have had it? Just about everybody. That we usually use it for six to 12 weeks before it starts to work. That if we do so, it has an 80% response rate for, for non-organ threatening lupus and skin lupus. It does decrease flare rates and spread of the disease. It thins the blood, it lowers cholesterol, and it's very safe. And it can be used with pregnancy and with breastfeeding. Steroids are used for, in high doses for anybody with organ involvement, in low doses sometimes for those with milder disease in addition to animalarials. We have many different steroids we can use, but steroids can cause the patient lots of side effects. So we have to balance that. We manage kidney disease with steroids, with immune suppressives, depending on the biopsy pattern. And certain types of immune suppressives are better than others. And this just lists 10 immune suppressives that are available in lupus. All these drugs how many people in this room have been on one of these drugs? About two-thirds of you. These are agents that are steroid sparing. None of them are FDA approved for lupus, but they're all generally inexpensive and very accessible. Um, they kill bad cells, but they also kill good cells. So we need more targeted therapies. There's other niche therapies that are, there are drugs that are just used for the skin drugs that are just used for low platelets, drugs that are just used for the brain, drugs that are just used if your blood is sticky, drugs that are just used for Raynaud's, and drugs that lower pulmonary hypertension. And the only drug that's come out in the last 50 years for lupus is Benlista, which blocks a chemical called Bliss, which is a B-cell survival factor, and it is indicated since 2011 by the FDA for patients with antibody-positive lupus who are receiving standard of care therapy and still have active disease. So given all this, lupus still has an unacceptably high mortality and morbidity rate. All the drugs that I showed you under immune suppressives, almost eight of the 10 were available as early as 1965. We've made very little progress since then. Despite the improvements in survival rates, lupus patients have a higher than expected mortality rate that is significantly worse 
than the general population. This is from an epidemiologic project from the Mayo Clinic. That the risk of heart attacks in lupus patients age 35 to 44 is 50 times greater than in the general population. This is from the Framingham Heart Study. The lupus patients go to emergency rooms much more often than others and are hospitalized much more often than others. Most common reason for a lupus patient going to the emergency room is chest pain. That one-third of all lupus patients are no longer employed within five years of the diagnosis. And disability and loss of job is a huge uh, emotional and psychological um, devastating um, occurrence. And that even if you feel okay and are on minimal medication, the progression of damage to the organs has not decreased with time. And that one-third of all lupus patients occur permanent organ damage within five years of diagnosis, half the time with no symptoms. And even with low or minimal disease activity, this occurs. And this is from our slick cohort of several thousand patients studied in 35 international centers. The progression to end-stage renal disease, which means dialysis, has not changed since 1980. And, and even though it varies by race and socioeconomic status, the percentage of all groups, whites, blacks, those who were rich and poor, the percentage between 1980 and the present time who end up on dialysis is the same. So we need new drugs. We need to intervene. So the first organized effort to do a clinical trial was from a group called OMERACT, which is Outcome Measures in Rheumatology. And OMERACT has branches in all rheumatic disease, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis. They published their first paper in lupus in 1999, and they said, if we want to get a drug on the market, we have to decrease disease activity, decrease organ uh, uh, progression, make the patient feel better, and improve their quality of life. So the FDA put out a guideline in June 2010 that said, guys, we're going to give you fast track for getting a lupus drug on the market if you do the following. And they list certain things. And guess what? 19 drugs have been try tried with these FDA guidelines, and they've all failed. Only bilimumab and a new drug called anafrolimab has shown some success. Why did these trials fail? It's because we didn't know what we were doing. The drug didn't work. The drug wasn't safe. The trial design was flawed. The outcome measure was wrong. The logistics of the trial were wrong. Patients were told to stay on the wrong medicines. They were put on steroids or taken off steroids in a way that's totally artificial and never used in the real world. And the assessment domains were all wrong. So drugs that are being studied to look for lupus, some of them block T cells. Some of them block B cells. Some of them attack complement activation. Some of them block cytokines. Some deal with the adaptive immune system. Some deal with the innate immune system. Some promote tolerance. Some deal with the cell surface receptors. And at last looking, there are 39 drugs right now in phase two or three lupus trials using those FDA guidelines. So we need to change them. And the organization that you're part of, Lupus LA, with the Lupus Research Alliance, which it's affiliated with, is working on changing the paradigm so the drug trials will work. In other words, rather than taking all comers with lupus, we're taking those with UCTD to prevent them from getting lupus. We're taking those with early disease to induce remission. We're taking those who are doing well to keep maintain the improvement. We want to prevent flares, and we're also studying lupus by organ system, just skin lupus, just kidney lupus. And if we do that, we can do a small trial 
that's cost effective with the few hundred patients if we have well characterized phenotypes in academic centers. We have a huge unmet need for those with mild to moderate disease, patients who are on Plaquenil and still don't feel well and don't want steroids and don't want chemo. There is nothing going on for pediatric lupus. It's a huge unmet area. So the most efficient method for advancing lupus therapy is to study promising agents in highly enriched populations by experience-centered with good metrics. And using this, in the next five years, we will see some major advances. There is a table outside from our clinical trial center, and I should tell you that UCLA, Loma Linda, UC Irvine also have trial centers, and their drug, their, the studies that they're doing are available through Lupus LA. We can give you the referrals. But the advantage of a trial is your medical care is free. If you are not sure, if you are eligible for a trial, we will give you a free consultation where it can at least advise you where to go and what resources you could have. So what I'd like everybody to do right now is fill out their three by five cards, stretch for three minutes, and, um, and then we will go through the cards. Thank you. Um, You do have time to go to the bathroom if you want to, um, but we will start in three to four minutes. Two minute warning, two minutes. Ninety second warning. Last chance to fill out your cards. All right. Here we go. Oh, my goodness gracious. What are you doing to me, Toby? All right. All right, we're going to start. What? I have 30. I thought I only had till 10.15. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is, you take this. And when I come back, we'll start. I'm going to do them all in 30 minutes, okay? Do you want me to sort them for you? No. No, okay. All right, Dr. Wallace said he's going to answer all of these questions in 30 minutes. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Any more? How do we find the patient? We are going to post it on our website, and I believe, Catherine, uh, I think we might be emailing you all a link if you register for the conference. I believe we're sending you a link. Um, but I do know that we're also on the website. It's probably going to take about a week or two to get it on the website. Yes. Oh, thank you so much.
Thank you. And Megan and Sally are outside. I like to say that our our team is small but mighty. Yes. What? I'm going to answer one question. Um, yeah, so the really great thing about lupus organizations and the really confusing thing about lupus organizations is that there are a lot of them. So Lupus LA is our, we're our own 501c3. We used to be affiliated with the SLE Lupus Foundation in New York and the LRI Institute. We, we, are, we're, we are now our own organization. But there's also the Lupus Foundation of America, which is a national organization. They really focus mostly on some patient services and advocacy. They're out of Washington, D.C. Um, and then but I, I do think that they have a support group in Los Angeles as well. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it can be very confusing. There are several. Okay. All right. Uh, there, there is, happens to be a very long line in the women's room. But no, I just, I just uh, took care of it because I opened up the men's room, and now we have two lines. Well done, Dr. <laughs> All right. What about hemopoietic stem cell transplants? Stem cell for lupus um, is there's no more questions. That's enough. Stem cell for lupus is for people with very, very serious disease, has a 20% mortality rate. There's only three centers in the United States that really do it. The best is at Northwestern with Richard Burt, and it's for people who probably would have a greater than 50% chance of dying within a year, are the only people who are candidates. As opposed to just stem cell that you read about, which is sort of a, a loose term that means nothing, uh, there are some newer stem cell trials that will be started in lupus in the next year that CEDARS will actually be part of. Enbrel retains... Um, I don't understand. Enbrel retains heavy bloating of the chest, what to do. Well, Enbrel is not a lupus drug. It's a rheumatoid drug, and Enbrel should not cause um, bloating. What specific vitamins, herbal supplements may improve energy levels? Which ones are bad? Um, vitamin D is good. A healthy diet is good. Echinacea is bad. Alfalfa sprouts um, are bad. In our lupus book, which you can get online at Amazon, it has a table of 200 herb spices, nuts, and berries, and critically reviews them. Um, what can be done for lupus fog? Anxiety reduction, getting a good night's sleep, cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback, um, <clears throat> counseling, anti-malarial, serotonin boosters such as Prozac, in extreme cases, um, you go all the way to hyperbaric oxygen. But um, it can be uh, treated. It, it's very hard. It takes time and energy. Um, is there such a thing as being on the border of having lupus? That's UCTD. And what are the environmental factors that can cause lupus? Excessive sun exposure, um, any drugs that are photosensitizing such as uh, uh, certain antibiotics like minocycline, phenothiazine, um, exposure to certain organic solvents probably can cause 
uh, lupus. There are certain occupations uh, where there are increased prevalences of, of lupus, but it doesn't necessarily uh, cause it. Um, okay, anything that takes more than 100 words, I don't read. Um, what drugs can cause lupus? Um, the most common causes are anti-TNFs given for rheumatoid arthritis, which would be like Enbrel or Humira, antiarrhythmic drugs such as Pronestol, antihypertensives such as hydralazine. Rarely some of the statins given for cholesterol have been shown to cause lupus historically. d penicillamine there's 70 drugs that can cause lupus, but 14 of them cause 90% of cases. All drug-induced lupus goes away um, within six months with the exception of minocycline-induced lupus. What diets are recommends and food to avoid? It's just really a healthy diet. There is no immune diet, okay? You can eat just a healthy, good diet. Um, again, more than 100 words. I don't do it. Um, you have lupus while not having criteria, please elaborate. Well, I mean, you could have, by the ACR criteria, you could have a kidney biopsy or a skin biopsy read as lupus and not meet criteria. So this is just done for epidemiologic purposes. If your doctor says you have lupus, you really do. Why do they get chest pain? I guess everybody here is the they. How many people here get chest pains? You can have chest, that's the hardest differential in lupus. You can, have, you can have heartburn or esophageal spasm causing chest pain. You can have any of the forms of lung disease I talked about causing chest pain. You can have costochondritis or arthritis of the chest wall causing chest pain. You can have a shoulder bursitis or a breast implant causing chest pain. There are probably 50 different causes of chest pains in lupus patients, and you know, um, it's very, very. And, and you go to the ER, and all they do is give you a few Vicodin, which gets it. And then a day later, you're back to where you were. What is the correlation between lupus and leaky gut? The answer is none. Leaky gut it is, is sort, sort of a, a loose term, term that sort of now maybe has, has more, more credibility. credibility. It's, it's the, the microbiome or the micro or the bacterial makeup of the gut probably has something um, something to do with uh, producing inflammation. There are probiotics. There are certain antibiotics that might help, but there are no studies published yet showing any correlation with lupus. Can you please explain biofeedback and its benefits? So biofeedback is administered through psychologists. It's, for example, for Raynaud's. If your fingers turn different colors in cold weather and the fingertips hurt because you're, they're blue, you can, in other words, let's say instead of breathing um, 12 times a minute, which most of us do, which is every five seconds, if you were to go into a dark room turn off the light, relax, lay down, and breathe six times in a minute where you go five seconds in, five seconds out. And if you do that for three minutes, you will break most Raynaud's attacks. So also, um, there's breathing exercises that promote blood flow and oxygen to the brain. There are mechanisms by which you can put almost an app or some sort of GPS on your finger, and you can measure finger temperatures, and you want to raise the temperature five degrees by certain activities, you can do that. That's what biofeedback is. And there are controlled studies showing that it works. Um, why do my blood tests look normal when I feel so bad? So there's the people with lupus who feel terrible and look great on paper. Um, it's not your fault. It's the fault of medicine that we have not um, found the right biomarker or metric to measure it. Many people look at you and say, hey, you're fine. It's all in your brain. But I can tell you, it may, can be sometime. But there are, uh, you really need a experienced, intuitive physician who can go through um, all the factors that may be causing your symptoms. And it's not always all picked up in a blood test. What is known about the effect of lupus on women's menstrual cycles? 
The answer is there's usually a mild flare. And if you take like Advil or Aleve the day before your period and for two days after, that often two or three times a day alleviates it. And sometimes uh, lupus can flare a little bit during menstrual cycle. Lupus usually gets better uh, during menopause. Uh, it's okay to take uh, estrogen replacement therapy. The amount of hormone in that is only 20% of what's in a birth control pill. Is the olfactory system, which is the um, ears, uh, no, the smell, affected in lupus? Um, usually, most people with uh, lupus doesn't usually affect the olfactory or smell or taste so much. It's usually more people with lupus with Sjogren's, where you get very dry or the area gets infected. Um, are lamps for seasonal affective disorder okay for people with lupus? In other words, if you're living in um, Newfoundland and you go crazy because there's no sun and it's December and if you turn on an a lamp, is that okay? It really depends on the wavelength of the light and, um, and not, all, not everybody is light sensitive. So it really, um, you can talk to your um, dermatologist are there any new treatment options for mood factors such as antidepressants? Well, there's a whole revolution going on now because the FDA issued a guideline a few couple years ago saying that if you can improve patient import reported outcomes, the drug can get on the market. In other words, if the majority of people in a clinical trial say, I feel better, the drug can be approved even if it has no anti-inflammatory effect. And as a result of that, there is a um, huge investment right now with, a bunch, uh, with metrics you, that will measure this with new drugs. So the answer is we're going to have a lot more information on it. The most exciting one is something called the uh, PROMISE um, system put out by the NIH. Are heart palpitations caused by stress, anxiety, and depression? Yes. And what are your recommendations to get it under control? Well, sometimes you can get an echo of the heart to see if you have mitral valve prolapse. Um, look at what's going on in your life. Are you having trouble sleeping? Are you exercising? And is there other issues that are causing this, such as, let's say, being anemic or having a, their thyroid being off? What is the right dosage for Plaquenil? Does your body weight determine dosage? Yes, the right dosage for Plaquenil is five milligrams per kilogram, which can be anywhere from two to 600 milligrams a day. Most people are on two Plaquenil a day. With time, we tend to lower it to a one a day because it takes a long time to get out of the system. This one's more than 100 words. I have type five nephritis. Um, what does that mean? Type 5 nephritis is membranous nephritis. It's slower and indolent. It progresses to kidney failure in 20 years as opposed to five years. It's uh, generally well, um, very, most patients don't have symptoms unless they have a lot of fluid retention. And the best drug for it is probably Celsept. Um, what type of vitamin should I take? I mentioned fish oil is good. What else? Again, I refer you to our book, the lupus book, that you can get on Amazon, which goes through all of them. Uh, this one's in Spanish, so... Um, <laughs> yo quiero sabor... I'm going to need help with this. I think it has something to do with fevers, but I, I'm sorry. We'll have to answer it later. I sweat through T-shirts while putting on an ice collar around my neck. What can help getting sweating down? The most common causes of sweating in lupus is steroids. Prozac-like drugs can cause sweating. Menopause can cause sweating. Hormone imbalances can cause sweating. And infections such as tuberculosis can cause sweating. Early lymphomas cause sweating. Um, medicines recommended for osteoporosis, do calcium supplements work? Yes, they work, but not often that well. So we have the bisphosphonates. Um, well, okay, yeah, go ahead. another one in Spanish. Um, so this is basically asking, um, this person has a derma... Dermatomyositis? Thank you. Awesome. Okay. And this, and she wants to know, and, and the doctor told you that these are sister diseases, so she wants to know how many different types of lupus are there? Okay. Are there Spanish one too? 
lupus, um, dermatomyositis is an autoimmune disease, and it's the first cousin once removed of lupus, and about 10% of lupus patients meet criteria for another, year, for another disease, so it's called an overlap syndrome. For osteoporosis, we use bisphosphonates such as Fosamax or Boniva. For um, more serious osteoporosis, we use a drug called denosumab or Prolia. And if you're just fracturing all the time, there's an in daily injection called teriparatide or uh, Forteo. You can come up and ask me individually about those. This one is a duplicate. I already answered it. Um, when might, might we see a new drug for treatment? I guess that anaphrolumab may make it to the market in two to three years. It's an anti-interferon blocker. There's about three or four other drugs. Um, I, I bet in five years from now we will totally be treating lupus differently than we are now. There's a whole initiative from the Lupus Research Alliance called the Repurposing Initiative, which is where they, they looked at 125 drugs that are already on the market and already shown to be safe but not used in lupus, and they want to try them in lupus. They narrowed it down to 25 drugs that were extremely promising, and now they have a $50 million grant to look at 10 of them. So these 10 drugs, some are on the market for cancer. One is even on the market for diabetes, um, and these drugs are going to be tr looked at in clinical trials starting next month. So we're going to be doing 10 trials in the next two years of drugs that are already on the market that probably may work in lupus but nobody knows about yet. Um, what drugs induce lupus? I answered that. What to do uh, with lupus causes chest pain or back pain? I answer that just to add fibromyalgia to my other list. Um, are there other foods besides alfalfa that are triggers for lupus? Food allergies are very common, and they're not generalized. So if I eat tomatoes and it flares my lupus, that's just for me. That doesn't apply to anybody else who eats tomatoes. So that, that's why this whole bunch with nightshade vegetables that you may have read about in mice is nonsense. It's is that you find what you can eat and what you can't. It's, it's, it's not uh, generalizable. What do I think? Uh, do I think a gluten-free diet helps? Well, it helps metabolic syndrome. It helps you lose weight because it restricts carbs. Um, there is a form, a subset of celiac disease or gluten enteropathy that is autoimmune related that does respond to anti-inflammatories as well as restrictions. So some people, how many people here are on a gluten-free diet? So there are some, and you feel better on it? So, well, you're the one that wasn't tired, so. Uh, <laughs> All right, she's our poster child, Toby. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, for some people, it's appropriate. I love bread. Um, <laughs> how does exercise help? Exercise to strengthen your muscles, puts more oxygen into the tissues, and prevents osteoporosis. So we want isometric exercises that strengthens you and feels good, things like Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates. Um, we don't necessarily, if you're inflamed, like exercises that put more, cause, can cause more pain, such as weightlifting, rowing, tennis, bowling, golf. Uh, low impact aerobics is good, walking is good, bicycling and swimming are generally good. Okay, my spine seems to be degenerating. Is this a lupus-related issue? No, unless you have osteoporosis from uh, steroids. Uh, what are the 14 drugs uh, that cause lupus? I already listed some of them. How long is a safe time for Plaquenil eyes and damage? Plaquenil only causes eye damage in 2% in the first five years and only 5% in the first 10 years, but up to 20% after 20 years. So safe is 10 years or less. Watching it closely is 10 to 20 years. Taking it more than 20 years, look for other alternatives. But if you have to use it, do it. Get your eyes checked very carefully. This is another greater than 100 words. As the initial detection of protein in blood in the urine, can you reverse this by detoxifying the body in natural ways instead of getting on meds. I can't tell you 
how many colon perforations I've seen in the last 35 years on people who wanted to detoxify their body. Steroids weaken the lining and mucosa of the colon. So, yeah, you can detoxify yourself with a nice colon perforation. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> what diet is the, um, in lifestyle is the best match for lupus? Paleo, ketogenic, you know, whatever works for you as long as you have the adequate amount of vitamins and calories and, um, and you have a good support system and you're not terribly overweight or underweight. Do I recommend boosting vitamin, doing um, vitamin B tests and giving vitamin D? Vitamin D is low in about 30% of lupus patients, mostly because they avoid the sun. Uh, vitamin D, when it's low, can flare lupus. It's actually, I was the first person to write a paper on it in the mid-1980s. But, um, and supplementing vitamin D is probably a good idea, but it's overused. In other words, if a normal vitamin D is 30, if you're between 15 and 30, you're insufficient, not deficient. We generally only treat deficient vitamin D, which is below 15, which would cause symptoms. Are itchy fingers and face a lupus thing? No, lupus rarely itches. Is it okay to be on Plaquenil and Imuran at the same time? Yes. Uh, my CRP is 64. Does that mean my kidneys are affected? Uh, the problem is, is that CRPs um, in some labs, zero, one is normal, 10 is normal, 20 is normal, so I don't know what the normal range is, so unfortunately I can't answer your question. But a high CRP means look for infection. Can you still have lupus fog without an objective MRI or CT? Yes, the way to pick it up is to do a SPECT or PET scan. If lupus is the opposite of cancer, is there a chance of developing cancer? Uh, certain cancers are more common with lupus, such as lymphoma. Certain cancers are less common with lupus, such as breast cancer. But people with lupus can get any type of cancer. Um, a, um, this is another Spanish one. Um, what is your opinion of low-dose steroids versus steroid injection? Well, some people get Kenalog shots or Depomedrol shots how many, or Celestone shots. How many people have gotten those? They're usually used, about a third of you, they're usually used for acute flares to, if you're doing really okay, but you went out in the sun, you went to the beach, you flared, usually a shot will get you over an acute uh, situation. It usually lasts for several months. But if it's an ongoing uh, situation where the disease is just active, then you need, need oral daily steroids. So this person is saying that she has a lot of rash and a lot of itching. And is this lupus? Well, so again, lupus doesn't itch. Um, I would see your dermatologist, so I don't know. Do you have a higher chance of an MI with non-organ-threatening lupus? Uh, the answer is... It's not the 40 times greater, but it is definitely greater, maybe 5 to 10 times greater. Can non-organ threatening lupus develop into organ threatening? I think I answered that 20% risk in five years. Um, this I already answered. What measures can you do to live a healthy and prosperous life with lupus? Hang around here for the next four hours. You're going to hear that in great detail. It was a good show. Um, I took Plaquenil for a year had memory loss issues, what are some good alternatives? There are very few alternatives to Plaquenil. There is quinacrine, which is another animal oil that is, not, that is different. Some people use DHEA. Some people use low-dose uh, methotrexate or low-dose uh, prednisone. Um, I take echinacea for getting a cold. Should I stop using it? Yes. Um, how, how advertised was this conference? I'm really bothered that my doctor didn't tell me about this. It seems like my doctor... I'm going to take that question. I'm going to answer this later. Thank you for asking that. Um, how do you know if you have organ-threatening versus non-organ-threatening? Well, you can do an AKG and look at the heart, chest X-ray, or pulmonary functions and look at the lung. You can do a urine and look at the um, your, uh, kidney. You can do a liver test and look at uh, the liver. What is mesenteric vasculitis and how do you know if you have it? It's a very serious, life-threatening process. Everybody's in the hospital, half die from it. It's where you have, where you're bleeding from the rectum with high fevers and distended bowel. 
I see it once a year. It's very, very rare, and your doctor would know right away if you have it. Um, being a male with lupus, um, it's very lonely. That's why we could use the bathroom today. Um, <laughs> but they were father kids, and where were my chances? Uh, can a male with lupus father kids? Sure. Absolutely. In fact, our CEO just did. So, um, Knowledge is power. Statistics are great. What can a patient to do to counteract the increased risk of coronary arteries and stroke? Prevention. Have your blood pressure checked. Have your blood sugar checked. Have your cholesterol checked. Get an EKG. Um, get CT angiograms, which are non-invasive. Get specialized testing look at the, looking at different subsets of cholesterol. Get exercise testing. Um, can blood released in the urine be lupus? Can, urine, can blood in the urine be lupus related? Yes. If so, why? But you can have blood in the urine if you have a bladder polyp, if you have a cystitis, if you have an infection. Uh, what can be done about it? Well, you just need to see your urologist and have them look at the urine under the microscope and look for features of lupus such as cellular casts. Does lupus cause any type of gut issues like irritable colon? Lupus itself actually very rarely affects the gut. Mostly medicines given for lupus um, affect the gut. You can rarely get pancreatitis, rarely get lupus hepatitis, rarely get mesenteric vasculitis, but in aggregate it's less than 2% of people with the disease. Because of scarring in the brain, this has caused seizures, and uh, brain surgery is becoming an option. Is there a chance that um, the scarring will return? So there's a lot of people, some people in this room who had lupus many years ago, and they're fine. And all of a sudden, 20 years later, they go to a concert, somebody puts up strobe lights, they start to seize. They're taken to the emergency room, tell them, oh, I had lupus. Guy gives you massive doses of steroids. It's really a scar focus that lights up and it's causing the seizures. It's what we call organic brain syndrome. Treatments, some of the newer treatments do involve surgery, and if, um, and if you're at one of the major neurologic centers in this city, it's something that ablating it might help. Um, has lupus, has medical grade marijuana been shown to have any effects with lupus? Um, nobody's done the study. I have lots of patients that do it. I haven't noticed anything harm. Don't use marijuana and drive to use it sensibly. And, um, you know, so it's the same. But some people with pain, it does help. I've had eight lymph nodes removed this spring, and they're, they're swollen. So there is a condition called lymph adenitis, where the lymph node biopsy is just so active lymph node disease from, um, from lupus. Uh, preventive measures are to get lymphoma screens, such as protein electrophoresis and certain blood tests every year. Um, shrinking lung, what is it? Shrinking lung is sometimes people get inflammation of the gift wrapping around the lung, which causes scarring. And when they scar, they can't. T it hurts to take a deep breath. On an x-ray, it looks like the lung is smaller. And it's basically shrinking lung is uh, atrophy of the diaphragm from chronic inflammation. Treatment of it might be to remove the pleura or a pleurectomy. Um, most of the time, unless it's really painful, we just uh, ignore it. We're getting to the stretch here, believe it or not. What about shingles vaccine? Um, I used to say no, but the ACR has changed their guidelines. It's, if you're not on steroids or immune suppressives, it's probably a good idea to get a shingles vaccine. It's a live vaccine as opposed to a killed vaccine. So you have to be very uh, careful when you use it and not start steroids or chemo for at least a month after you take it. Um, I have discoid lupus, age 60. Do you know a rheumatologist at UCLA to see? There are several very good rheumatologists at UCLA who see lupus patients, mostly Jennifer Grossman or Maureen McMahon. Um, what are the long-term side effects of taking mycophenolate? Should I bring it up to my rheumatologist? Um, mycophenolate is also known as Celsept, and long-term, uh, you just have to watch the blood counts and watch for infection. Risk of lymphoma is one in 300. 
Um, it's generally very well tolerated. The drug came out in the mid 80s, so there's people who've been on it for 30 years. So short note, but it's two whole sides, forget it. Um, are you in remission? Can your ANA go negative or does it always stay positive? ANAs can go negative. Steroids and immune suppressives can make an ANA negative. Also, the labs that do ANA are not standardized. What's positive in one lab could be negative in another. This is the first I heard about a connection between lupus and lymphoma. Can you explain? It's really Sjogren's in lymphoma. Um, one in a thousand people in the United States get a lymphoma at some point in their life, and maybe it's a little increased in lupus, and almost all those people all also have Sjogren's. But there are some drugs used for lupus, such as Imuran, methotrexate, which also over long periods of time can increase risk for lymphoma. People have said that those with autoimmune disorder should lupus should fall with, well, this is gluten-free, we already handled that. Um, this is, um, is the focus on pediatric lupus so low that, many pe that um, not too many pediatric children with lupus are, di are diagnosed? The problem is, what happened is, is there's only 200 pediatric rheumatologists in the United States, whereas in other subspecialties of pediatrics, there's many more. And this deals with the fact that, in a, that if I wanted to do pediatrics as board certified in adult rheumatology, I am not allowed to by any children's hospital. But that's because of the pediatric subspecialty boards has a rule saying that I can't. But if I was an adult cardiologist, I would be allowed to practice pediatric cardiology because the cardiology board, um, boards let you do that. So part of the reason why we don't have enough pediatric rheumatologists is political, which is a darn shame. So as a result, it sometimes takes 6 to 12 months to see a pediatric rheumatologist. And there's only about 30 in training in the United States, and a third of them are going to go back to their country when they finish their training. So uh, it's really, really sad, and it's a major problem. And um, fortunately, we have a pediatric rheumatologist chairman of our scientific advisory board, and you know we're working with him. But there's really uh, no good way to deal with that. I would say see an adult rheumatologist. Uh, you can see them in their office if they will. I see people, let's say, that are 12 or older. Um, OK. What? Oh, okay. Well, this is a repeat. This is blank. Um, how does obesity affect lupus? Steroids um, and certain medications such as NSAIDs. Um, okay, this is another long one. Um, what are this is for you to answer later, Toby? This deals with local support groups. Um, Anything about socioeconomic factors and patient advocates? Again, this is something you can answer. Received um, an email from the LFA about voclosporin. What is voclosporin? Voclosporin is a drug like cyclosporin that was subject of a trial in lupus nephritis, and it was very successful, very promising, and it cured lupus nephritis in a lot of people, but 15 of the 200 people in the trial died. Um, who got the drug and none of the people who got placebo. So they have to figure out why these people died before we go to the next step. Um, lupus again, environment. Okay, this is too long. And then we have, are there any known treatments for calcified muscle tissue? God, that's so heartbreaking. Calcinosis, there is no good treatment for them, and if you remove it, it grows back. I've been waiting, it's my holy grail, I've been waiting for treatment for that for 30 years. Any um, special, um, again, this is for you. So, I did it. Wow. <laughs> We're right on time. I, I'm, I'm, sh I'm you're, you're actually the first and only presenter ever to finish the questions. It's amazing. And the really long ones will go over to make sure that we didn't miss anything. But um, I'm going to take two minutes to just answer some of these, some of these cards, and then I'm going to give you a 14, 13-minute break. Uh, any special issue for men with lupus? 
I think he answered. There's actually a huge section on our website um, about men uh, that have lupus. And if you're a man that has lupus, uh, go see Catherine. Um, I would love to start a men's only support group for lupus patients. So if that's something you might be interested in, I would love to hear about it also. Um, are there anything about socioeconomic, patient advocates, the whole next section is all about that. Okay to share tape with local support groups. Absolutely. Actually, that's the same person who asked those two questions. Um, so beep beep at gmail.com. Excellent questions. Come and see me and introduce yourself. Uh, how is this conference advertised? So this conference was advertised in a couple ways. We have a patient list of about 1,000 lupus patients throughout Southern California that we market to. We also send it out to our entire mailing list as well, which is many thousands of people. Um, but uh, the, the, the best part about this question, it seems like our doctor would want us to go. So here, here's the deal. Lupus LA, we... We, I say we're small but mighty, and when people know about us, they're like, oh my God, there's this lupus organization that you have to go to. But the only way for us to reach other doctors, and we're doing active outreach now to doctors outside of our partner hospitals, which is Loma Linda, UC Irvine, UCLA, Cedar sinai and Children's Hospital, Los Angeles, we are doing marketing to doc, um, other doctors or providers that are members of the ACR, which is the American College for Rheumatology. If you go to your rheumatologist or pretty much any of your ISs, so your dermatologist, your pulmonologist, your cardiologist, your neurologist, your all of your ISs, tell them about Lupus LA. And if they want us to come and visit them, we'll do that. We send out packets of information. I would love to see Lupus LA flyers and those little squeezy balls when you do your blood test at every, every lupus provider there is in Southern California. And for us to really do that effectively, we need your help. So um, if you want to be the advocate and we'll send you the stuff to bring to your doctor's office, thumbs up. If you talk to your doctor's office and you don't want to do that, and you want us to call the doctor's office, and you have a name of someone who we could call, we'll do that. Um, we're going to also start having some provider um, meet and greets with bagels. We're going to bribe them to show up uh, to try to expand our reach into the lupus provider network. Um, again, the more people that know about Lupus LA, the more people that know about lupus, the better we are about getting access to treatment, getting information out, and making our lupus community larger so there's just more support to go around. So with that, I'm four minutes late, which means you've got 11 minutes for break. Please make sure you go see the uh, clinical trials table outside if you're interested. There's still food, coffee, juice, water, bathrooms. Be back in your seats at 1045 sharp, please.